We're back, and with me here in the studio is Connie Willis. Connie, welcome back to Fast Forward. Thank you. It's fun to be here again. It's always fun to have you as a guest. So. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about kind of your career. Did you always know you were good? Your, your, Such your as it is. Such as it is. <laughs> What's left of your career. Right. Um, did you always know you were going to be a writer? That's a complicated question. <laughs> yes, I always wanted to be a writer from about, I can't remember a time I didn't want to be a writer. But I did not think I would ever be able to earn a living at it. And so I, I was thinking more on the Emily Dickinson model. And then as I got older and started reading science fiction, I was thinking more on the Zena Henderson model where she, you know, she, start, she was a teacher. She wrote during spring break. She wrote at Christmas and so on. But she had an actual job. And so I trained as a teacher uh, the whole time having also an English major and intending to write. And then I taught for two years and then um, I had a baby, and in those days they could fire you for having a baby. Mm -hmm. And so at that point I decided to stay home with the baby and to try to try to start my writing career. I still thought of it, I think, at, at that point of so, sort of a source of additional income, you know, kind of, um, but not, I, it never occurred to me that I'd be able to like really do the writing full time my whole life, which is great. I love doing that, but but that it, it really that didn't dawn on me till much much later. So and the first book so. you had published was the collaboration with uh, Cynthia with Felice? Cynthia Felice. The, mm -hmm. we Cynthia and I did three collaborations, starting with Water Witch, and that was very fun. But I was I c considered myself a. Uh, short story writer and actually I wanted to sort of pattern my life and like I say Zena Henderson who had mm -hmm. a series of connected stories the people and the people stories which are <laughs> God, so yes. wonderful um, or like Harlan Ellison who was just a short story writer and had made his name that way so I didn't start my first my own first novel till Lincoln's Dreams and that was like 10 years into my career and at that point it wasn't intentional it wasn't at, well now is the time to switch to novels it was I had written a novella called Lincoln's Dreams, and when I took it to my writer's workshop, all the comments were things like, um, I, I don't understand this. You need to further explain this. I wish I knew more about this. And so I was like, well, if I keep adding stuff, it's going to be a novel. So, But a novella can't just have stuff added to it and be a novel. <laughs> so I had to completely restructure the whole thing and start from scratch. And then that was my first novel. And, and since then, I've written both, both things, the short stuff and the novels. I still like the short stuff the and, best. And you win awards for them, too. Yeah, well, like, like all of them. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, some. <laughs> and, I mean, but, your Christmas stories are just loved by everybody. Well, thank you. I love my Christmas stories, too. They're, they're the most fun to write. I love Christmas and the whole, it's my favorite holiday because it's such a mess, you know? It's, it's a mess. It's, it's, um, it's a religious holiday, but it's also a secular holiday. It's a national holiday. It's sort of a historical holiday in that it evokes all this tradition going all the way back to the Middle Ages and stuff. And it, it's just, it's this giant, like, if you didn't have it, if there was no such thing as Christmas, you would have to invent something else like it because otherwise, you know, it's a way to get together with your relatives who you hate and your relatives who you love and all your friends once a year and keep track of everybody. And particularly and that time of year. Exa exactly. That time of year, especially mm -hmm. when nothing else is going on. Uh, and as someone said, Christmas wouldn't be worth any, uh, you know, winter wouldn't be worth anything without <laughs> Christmas in the middle. And that's so true because it's, you know, it's hard enough to face January. But if you had to face it without Christmas or without yeah. something going on <laughs> with lots of lights in the middle of the winter and lots of food, I think it would be very bad. So yeah. I'm always fascinated by this very, you know, uh, kind of mixed mess that it is. And and by the fact that people get so bent out of shape because they're like, well, we have to, it's either a religious or a secular holiday, or it's either this or that. And of course, it's really all of them yeah. messed together. And so did you like the nice. TV movie they made out of one of your Christmas stories? Did you see it? Yes, I did see it. And yeah, I liked it. They, they took all the science fiction out of it. <laughs> well, I was like, oh, that's so strange. <laughs> what, what is causing this huge storm, if not some science fictional thing? But yeah, I, it was interesting to watch. I was... I was basically ter terrified by the prospect. Um, most people think that if you get a movie deal, you're like instantly happy. But really, I was very scared of, I'd seen so many horrible things done to books that I loved. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, the, the, one of the reasons I thought this might work was because it was a series of interconnected little yeah. stories. And I thought, well, to shorten it, maybe they'll just take out a couple of those stories rather than 
destroying all of the stories. And that was pretty much what they did. And so I, it yeah, was a, it was a nice little TV yeah, movie. Yeah, it was a it nice, was it was a nice movie, and I and I wasn't horrified, but I, I had not told anyone it was going to be on because I was so afraid. I was like, oh, if this is awful, you know, I'm just going to want to kill myself, and I'd rather do that in private than you know publicly. <laughs> And then everyone said, oh, we're having viewing parties. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I should invite some people over. And so they spent, everyone that we invited over, spent the entire movie looking at me. Something would happen on the screen, and then they would look at me to see what my, and I was like, well, I must not cry. That was, and, and the, I had a short list of, if they do these things, I will kill myself. And they didn't do any of those. And obviously, because you're still here. I'm still here, and I and it was actually easier than I thought. But I still, you know, if it was something like Doomsday Book, I think yeah. that would be really hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, something that was really the child of my heart, and then they changed everything about it. Yeah. I don't know. It, but movies aren't, they're a different form. I love movies. I'm a huge movie fan. Oh, yeah. So, so I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. <laughs> and of course, it made you rich because you they made a movie out of one of your stories. <laughs> right, so instantly you rich. You must be, you know, independently wealthy <laughs> Absolutely. now. Absolutely, <laughs> you betcha. You betcha. Well, there's so much mo money in writing and in yeah. the arts general. That's uh, generally, true. that's that true. It's just and I mean, we all know you love movies. I love Anyone it. that knows anything about you know you yeah. love movies. Yeah. And um, you, your story remake, your book remake, was all about movies. All about the movies. Yes. And the research for that must yeah. have been. The painless, most fun. painless, absolutely painless. Now, painless. was that the most fun book you had researching a book, do you think? Most fun I had researching. No, because I love World War II. Oh, okay. And so, so, the, so all the time travel, that's World War yeah. II, Firewatch and Blackout and All Clear. Is, yeah. That's, that's the most fun, because that's, that's what I would be reading about anyway, <laughs> even if I didn't have a, this job. Um, but I love the movies, and I, I loved being able especially to watch the Fred Astaire and Ginger yeah. Rogers musicals yeah. and and all the musicals. I'm a huge musical comedy yeah. fan. Um, I made one huge mistake in the book and that was that I, for one scene, I needed to watch the a, a tap routine from T for Two over and over again. One of the worst movies ever <laughs> made. And Doris Day, you know, she has those huge teeth to begin with and every time I watched her smile got bigger and bigger and her teeth got bigger and bigger till I was like dreaming about it at night. It was frightening, frightening. So you have to be careful what you're going to research. You know? uh, oh, I see. So I see. You, you just make sure that you pick the right movies to research. But I love doing that and I would love to write another book about Hollywood because I, it's, I love Hollywood. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the, the book remake is like, it's a fascinating book because of the science fictional elements of it. Mm -hmm. But the movie stuff in it, particularly if you're a movie fan like I am, it just brings back all this stuff and these things where you're reading because they're changing movies. Right, yes, they're changing and movies. And you're sitting there right. just horrified at something. Right, things. and they're doing that now. Yeah. They do it all the time. I saw today in the Times that they're, um, the, they're going to bring out Titanic again um, in, in 3D. In 3D this time, I'm like, why? Why are you doing that? But then I was like, maybe they could fix the plot yeah, of that right. movie while they're at it. I have a few suggestions. So I thought I'd write them and say, <laughs> That's a, I've got I have it, a here, few some, suggestions from beginning to end, <laughs> as long as you're doing this. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, now, yeah. you mentioned Lincoln's Dreams, yeah. Uh, yeah. which was what the, the first book. That was, the first, first, that was that, my uh, first your novel. First novel. Yeah. Yeah. And that one is about write novelists. It's about, part of it is about how... Novelists, that's true. Yeah, the way you, you kind of, everything that goes on of your, in your life is you're, you could use. Right. And, yes. and what that means to the novelist. Is yeah. that the way you are? Yeah, I, pretty much, pretty much. I, um, the, the one thing about, about writing is that you, you really do become sort of schizophrenic. You know, there's, there's the one part of you when something terrible happens to you that is fully, I mean, you're feeling how you're feeling and you're feeling loss or grief or fury or whatever. And then there's the other part that is taking notes the whole time. And it's a really, and you feel so guilty about it at first because you're like, the fact that I have this sort of distance and can take notes at this terrible time must mean there's something seriously wrong with me. And then after a while, you just kind of go, well. You're a writer. I'm a writer, so I guess I'll, I'll go with it. It's but maybe that twist in the brain chemistry yeah. is what makes somebody a writer. Yeah. As opposed to somebody that just has ideas. Right. And what, and what I'm always so shocked by is how, how long things stay in the memory. 
that I'm not really aware of until I need them in a story. And then, and then they sort of pop forward. I'm like, oh, I'll just stick that right here. This, mm. The fact that I know this particular, you know, particular thing. And, uh, and, and I, I was reading uh, Steve Martin's book, Born Standing Up. Oh, great oh, book. I want to get that. Oh, it's I had it on my book. Christmas list. It's, I didn't get it. It's a great book. And, uh, but he talks about how he, um, when he was like 10, he worked at Disneyland. And he learned all these magic tricks, which, of course, his whole comedy routine is really one long magic act, you know. And then, but then how he, he sold balloon animals at Disneyland. And he, and he could never make the giraffe or the, you know, whatever they are. And he said, so his specialty was to make them into unrecognizable shapes. And immediately I thought of his movie Parenthood, mm -hmm. where the clown doesn't show up or the cowboy doesn't show up for the kid's birthday party. And he has to substitute. And so he, he comes out and he makes this horrible balloon animal that looks like nothing at all. And then he holds it up and says, oh, your lower intestine. <laughs> yes. And so I was like, and he, he pulled that right out of age 10 yeah. and all the way 40, 50 years later, you know. And I, I was very impressed with that. Something I've been wanting to talk to you about, and we haven't yet in all the different interviews, is your writing process. Oh, it's pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... You know, everyone asks writers, where do you get your ideas? Well, the ideas are everywhere. The trick is, of course, taking the ideas and making it into a story right. and characters right. and things like that. Right. What is your process as you're going through that? When you're writing, what do you start with? Okay. What's the first thing you do? Well, usually, usually I start with the premise. I always do the plot first and then the character second, which drives people crazy. Because they're always saying, well, I had this idea for a character and I learned what they had for breakfast, and how many brothers and sisters they had, and where they went to elementary school. And I'm like, no, that isn't how you do it. What you do is you, you come up with this plot, and then you need this certain kind of characters to fit this plot, and then you, that's how you get your characters. And everyone thinks that's a horribly cold-blooded way to do it, but it's how I work. Well, you're a cold-blooded person. I'm a cold-blooded person. So, but I usually, it's usually a premise. And then I sort of noodle around with that premise. I'll get this idea that, you know, I'm going to have someone abducted by aliens. And then I think, well, who would be abducted by aliens? And how would they be abducted? And would they like it or would they not like it? And, and okay, and then make a list of all the horrible cliches about being abducted by aliens, because I don't want to do any of those. And how can I do something that's different from what everyone else has done so far? And and then, but it's just an endless amount of noodling around and getting great ideas in the middle of the night, which do not sound nearly so great in the morning. You have to have like, I have this rule that you can't, I can't change my plot on the basis of something I thought of in the middle of the night. I have to wait like three days because the what's wrong with it will not occur to me for three days. And so then after that, I can go, oh, here's why that wouldn't work, of course. So, but I, it, you know, I always talk about outlining, and I usually do do my entire plot before I write the book because I, it's usually a mystery plot, and you can only write mystery plots backwards. And I usually have tons of foreshadowing, and you can only do that backwards. So, so I usually have the whole plot, but that doesn't mean that the plot comes to me in any kind of coherent way. It means endless pieces, pieces, pieces. of plot. Well, I could do this. Well, I don't want to do that. But yeah. if I did this, no, that won't work. But oh, how about if I did this, and then I could connect that with this. Mm -hmm. And if this were a romantic comedy, then I could do this and this and this. Oh, I and, see. So you're not you even know, sure so what. I'm not ever sure, sure what it is. And then yeah. you get your plot built in, right. and that's telling and then you. The char and that tells me what characters I want. Because like right now, I'm working on a story that's due, due already, uh, and not done, as usual. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it's, it's about a robot who wants to be a rocket. And that's what I started with. What I started with is I was watching a robot who wants to be a rocket. Yes. And I started with that because I had, uh, we went to the Radio City Music Hall Christmas show and I was watching them come out, you know, and they do their like tin soldiers number and they're all alike and they're all in perfect, you know, sync and everything. And I was like, wow, they look like robots. And I was like, if I was a robot, that's what I would want to be, as a rocket. And then I put that together with the quote from, um, which I don't think I can say on TV, uh, from Chorus Line, which is mm, blank the rocket, uh, blank the red shoes, I wanted oh. to be a rocket, and, which is my favorite line from that entire play. And, and then I was like, okay, now, now how do I do this? And, and obviously a boxy C-3PO type 
robot, could not be a rocket. So, so what kind of robot could be a rocket? And why would she want to be a rocket? And how would she be in New York seeing the Radio City Music Hall to even know about the rockets? And and then and okay, who's going to tell this story? Not the robot. That's oh, mm. usually usually the person the story is happening to is not a good person to tell it. Oh, really? Yeah. Usually, See, I'm not a writer, so I don't know these little tricks. It's better to, for me, for me anyway. I can the kinds of things I want to tell. I need somebody else to tell it. So who would tell this? And then I thought, well, maybe how about if she also the robot also went to see a play that the Radio City Music Hall was just part of a series of events that this robot was taken to, and went to see a play. Then I could have the actress in the thing be in the play be the person who tells the story but why would she have gone to you know it just so kind of goes like it that really it really is just noodling it, it around it really is just noodling around and then periodically things come in from like left field i happen to be watching um the the margo channing what's it called all about oh, eve, all about all, eve. all about eve uh with betty davis it's going to be a bumpy night yeah it's going to be a bumpy <laughs> night and so then i thought you know that dynamic of the person who's afraid of her job being lost mm -hmm. to the younger prettier better actress uh, really plays very nicely into the whole robots well, kind of thing. And well, let me ask stuff, you this. So. When do you know when you're done noodling and it's time to like actually write the damn thing? Well, usually what happens is I never reach that particular point and then start writing. What I reach is a point where I can write this first scene or I can write this scene in the car or I can write the scene in front of Radio City Music Hall and then I write that and then to write that, I realized that in the scene before that, or the scene after, I'm going to need this, 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 and this. And then it just sort of starts to grow out from whatever scene I was able to write. And usually I write random scenes that I know how to write, and then fill in the blanks. And it, it's all, And then occasionally I realize there's still a big hole left somewhere that I haven't figured out, and I have to replot that part. But. And then you write it, and then like most writers I've ever talked to, you hit the point going, Oh, this just sucks. This just sucks. Just it just sucks. sucks. I can't write. This it's all falling apart. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. Exactly. Exactly. And for me, it's a really long process. I've had stories with as long as 10 to 15 years lead time wow. where I had that initial idea and, and I reached a, a block of some kind that I couldn't get past or I was missing a, an extra piece that I needed, you know, to make it all work. And then I just have to wait around for that piece to show up. And that's short stories as well as the novel. And that's short stories as well wow. as the novel. In fact, I have a story, an Orpheus story, that I've been trying to write for the past 12 years. And I think I've got it now. Think you I, got it? Yeah, but I'm not sure. Well, so. well, I hope you have it. I, I hope we get so to too. read it someday. <laughs> yeah. um, we're out of so, time. Okay. And um, Which I hate. But I hope the next time you're back in the area, we'll come and we'll talk some more. Okay, that'd be great. great. I would love that. Yeah, thank That's you. Terrific. Thank you so much. Well, from all of us here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.